اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ وحدہ والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبی بعد ما بعد In our last class on Tuesday some of the brothers had had questions about uh the issue of Bani Israel and uh, the command of Musa alayhi salam for, uh, for them to kill themselves. <coughs> so today inshallah ta'ala we're going to uh, have a small discussion on the issue of Bani Israel uh, and the issue of the Ijl or the issue of the Kaf. So first of all, uh, as we know, Israel is Yaqub. Yaqub is the son of Ishaq. And Ishaq is the son of Ibrahim, alayhi salam. And Bani Israel, so, is, is, uh, so Yaqub had 12 sons. Yaqub had 12 sons, and these are what they call the 12 tribes of Israel. And these 12 sons make up Bani Israel. And so all of the, uh, all of the, uh, the Dhuriya that came after, or that came from these 12 sons, these are all considered to be Bani Israel whether they're from son number one or son number two, son number three, son number, son number four, son number 10, son number 12, alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. All of these sons and grandsons and great-grandsons and great-great-grandsons, all of them make up Bani Israel. Uh, and so Bani Israel, or let, let's take a step backwards. Um, Yaqub, uh, he didn't live in Egypt at first. Where did they live at? Does anybody know? Hold on. Well, uh, that was from the, Median was from the sons of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, but not from Bani Israel. Well, Yaqub, Afwan, it wasn't from Yaqub. Uh, or Ishaq, or... Uh, Ismail Median was a different son that came from a different wife. Inshallah, we talk about that uh, at a different time. Inshallah, that would t- that would take us down a whole different a whole different road. Inshallah. Uh, right. So they were in that area. They were in that area. Tayyib. How they got to Egypt was from Yusuf, alayhi salam. When the brothers tossed Yusuf in the well, and Yusuf was picked up by some travelers, and he was sold to the Aziz of, of Egypt, and everybody knows that story. We don't think we need to go into that into detail. So from there, Yusuf alayhi salam, at the end of that story, we know that Yusuf had called for his whole family to come, right? Because he had position, right? He had a position, he had status, and so he called for his family to come. And, <clears throat> and so his family, his father, his mother, and his brothers, they all came to, to Egypt, and they settled in Egypt, all right? Then time went on, and generation passed, another generation passed, and then the Fir'aun that we know of, uh, that's mentioned in the Qur'an, he takes over, and he enslaves Bani Israel. He makes them, he turns them into slaves. After they once had a position, they had status, because of Yusuf, now they are turned into, into slaves. And Fir'aun and his magicians, they come with some prophecy that, uh, alaykum salam wa rahmatullah, that a prophet is, is going to come or someone's going to come and dethrone him. So he starts killing uh, all of their male children to be born. And he leaves a year. That's how Harun was born. And then Musa uh, was born and his mother sent them into hiding. We all know the story of Musa alayhi salam. So, uh, these stories 
all of these stories, this story in particular, but all, the stories of the prophets, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered uh, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in turn ordering us to remember and mention these stories. Allah ta'ala mentions in the Quran, so tell the stories in order that they may ponder. Tell the stories in order that they may ponder. Allah Ta'ala also mentions, uh, And indeed, in their stories is uh, a reminder or is a lesson for those people of understanding. And Allah Ta'ala in specific has ordered the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to mention the story of Musa Alaihi Salam uh, when he mentions وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مُوسَى إِنَّهُ كَانَ مُخْلَصًا وَكَانَ رَسُولًا نَبِيًّا And mention in the book Musa And mention in the book Musa Indeed he was chosen and he was a messenger and a prophet <coughs> And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, was specifically Order to mention Musa and his story. And because the Prophet himself, alayhi salatu wasalam, one of the hadith that we talked about on Tuesday was how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam kana yatasabbar bi qissati Musa. That he used to use the story of Musa to uh, allow himself to be patient. For example, in the hadith uh, that we mentioned was the hadith of Hunayn. Uh, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had gave uh, Al-Aqra ibn Habis and, uh, and Uyayna and some others from the Arabs gave them a hundred camels, gave this one a hundred camels <coughs> and, and so one of the people has said you know, this, this, div this division of wealth was not uh, for the sake of Allah and so at the, at the end of that hadith the Prophet says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam يَرْحَمُ اللَّهُ مُوسَى uh, قَدْ أُوذِيَ بِأَكْثَرَ مِنْ هَذَا فصبر. He said, may Allah have mercy upon Musa. Indeed, he was uh, troubled and bothered with more than this, but he was patient. And so the Prophet ﷺ used to utilize the story of Musa السلام, uh, as a means uh, uh, to help him be patient with what he used to deal with uh, from his own people. Now, <coughs> we mentioned Musa alayhi salam or Bani Israel and what they were going through with Fir'aun and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent Musa uh, and he sent Harun uh, to save Bani Israel uh, from Fir'aun and the oppression uh, that Fir'aun was, uh, was placing on them. And so Allah azza wa jal saved Bani Israel, and drowned Fir'aun and his people. And drowned Fir'aun and his people. Allah Ta'ala mentions this uh, in the Qur'an when he says, وَإِذْ فَرَقَنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرُ فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ أَغْرَقَنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ Allah Ta'ala says, and when we uh, separated the bahr, we separated the sea, and we saved you, and we drowned uh, Fir'aun, we, we drowned, when we drowned the, uh, the people of Fir'aun while you were watching. We drowned the people of Fir'aun while you were watching, meaning we saved you and we drowned your enemy while you were looking on. This wasn't something that took place after, you know, when they were far gone and they heard about it, someone told them about it. No, they witnessed the destruction of the people of Fir'aun with their own eyes. Okay, so now they've crossed the sea, right? All that has happened and taken place before, the slavery, the killing, the oppression, all of that. Now Allah Ta'ala has saved them. They, they watched Fir'aun and the people of Fir'aun, they watched them drown. And all, all, as it may be, because if, if they would have crossed the sea without actually seeing uh, the people of Fir'aun, Fir'aun drowning and being destroyed, maybe some of them or maybe most of them would have still had some type of fear that maybe Fir'aun is going to come back and get them. Right? Maybe, you know, they would maybe living in fear, looking over their shoulders, not really sleeping well at nighttime, 
out of fear that the soldiers of Fir'aun were going to come into their tents and, and drag them back into slavery. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only destroyed Fir'aun and his people, but he allowed for Bani Israel to actually witness their destruction as an added measure of safety and security. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did that. After, after this, <coughs> after they crossed the sea, after they cross into uh, the sea, they, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered for Musa to come to him for a period of 40 days. To come to him for a period of 40 days. وَإِذْ وَعَدَنَا مُوسَىٰ أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً ثُمَّ اتَّخَذْتُمُ الْعِجْلَةً مِنْ بَعْدِهِ وَأَنْتُمْ ظَالِمُونَ Allah Ta'ala says, and when, uh, and when Allah uh, gave the appointed time to Musa for 40 days, and then you all took the ijl, and you all took the calf uh, after he had left while you were oppressive. While you were oppressive. <coughs> and so, uh, we talked about this before. Uh, Allah Ta'ala he appointed for Musa 30 laylah wa tamamnaha bi'ashr fa tamma miqatu rabbih 40 laylah as Allah Ta'ala mentioned uh, and so that 30 days uh, was the month of what who remembers the 30 days of the 40 the, thir the 30 days was what was what month uh, we just talked about this a couple of months ago on the khutbah when we started the month of the Hijjah, we talked about this. The 10 days, okay, how about let's do this. The 10 days was, was from what month? The Hijjah, okay, very good. So the 30 days was from? The Qidah. So the 30, so the 40 days, the 40 days, the first 30 was the month of the Qidah, and the 10 days, what Mamnaha bi Ashr. And we completed those 30 days with 10 days. Those were the 10 days of the Hijjah. فَتَمَّ مِقَاتُ رَبِّهِ أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً So the, uh, the appointment of his Lord was completed as uh, 40 days. So why did they take the Ijjah? Why would Bani Israel, why would they, after being saved from uh, from, their, from their oppressor, why would they take uh, a calf made out of jewelry? Why would they do that? It's not from the religion of their people, like the Kufar of Quraysh, right? Uh, they, they had, it, you know, from generation after generation during the time of the Prophet, والسلام, by his generation, it was the tradition of their people to have deities, uh, that they worship besides Allah. But at the time of Musa salam, this was not their religion. They were upon the religion of their prophets. Right? They were upon the religion of their prophets. And so they didn't worship idols. So why now after they've crossed the sea, why would they have uh, begin to worship idols? Uh, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to try to mention a couple of reasons. The first reason is because once they crossed over the sea, they came across a group of people from uh, the mushrikeen, from the idol worshippers, and they saw that they were worshipping idols and they were tempted. Right, they were tempted by what, by they, what they saw them doing. Allah Ta'ala mentions, He says, وَجَاوَزْنَا بِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ الْبَحْرِ فَأَتَوْا عَلَىٰ قَوْمٍ يَعْكُفُونَ عَلَىٰ أَصْنَامٍ لَهُمْ قَالُوا يَا مُوسَىٰ اِجْعَ لَنَا إِلَٰهًا كَمَا لَهُمْ آلِهَا قَالَ إِنَّكُمْ قَوْمٌ تَجْهَلُونَ and, and we crossed the sea with Bani Israel uh, and they came across a people يَعْكُفُونَ عَلَىٰ أَصْنَامٍ لَهُمْ They were sitting in devotion to أَصْنَام that they had or idols that they had uh, قَالُوا They said يَا مُوسَىٰ اِجْعَ لَنَا Ilahan kama lahum aliha. Make for us a deity like they have deities. Right? So they saw these individuals, you know, practicing what they were practicing, and they they were allured into that. They were tempted by what they saw. They were tempted 
by what they saw. And Musa alayhi salam responded, he said, Innakum qawmun tajhalun. He said, you are people who are ignorant. You are people who are ignorant. And so one of the things that we extract from this is that there are people who are tempted by the things that they see. <coughs> They're tempted by the things that they see. And so therefore, we should not put ourselves, nor should we be putting our children and our families in situations where they're watching shirk and kufr. And they're witnessing shirk and kufr. And one of the things that I advise against, and when we think that is very innocent, and it's a common practice of innocence, uh, is sitting our children in front of Disney movies and letting our children sit you know, for hours on end watching part one, part two, part three, you know, Disney movie after Disney movie. And it's really cute as with, you know, uh, the little princess and the frog or, uh, you know, whatever, what else is they have? Uh, the, the mermaid, uh, the shismo, the princess with the, in the castle with the talking plates and stuff, Beauty, Beauty and the Beast. Um, they have all of these different movies that are, they are promoted as, you know, these are cute movies for children. But reality, if you've ever, if you ever sat down and watched Mickey Mouse, uh, Mickey Mouse is the Grand Wizard. And I think we talked about this before. Mickey Mouse is the Grand Wizard. Uh, and the whole, everything that's surrounded in Disney is about magic. Everything that's surrounded with Disney is, is, is about magic. You know, we call it the Magic Kingdom. You know, they call it the Magic Kingdom, and I've, and I've mentioned this every single night. You know, before coronavirus hit, every single night there was a celebration of magic. Every night. Right, the fireworks. At where? Where do they do the fireworks? At the, huh? At the castle. And doing it at the castle. And that's the Magic Kingdom. And so, any, and so many of my point is, there are people, and I'm not saying that every person is like this. I'm not saying every person is like this. However, there are people that when you bring them around situations, they get influenced by the things that they see. Just like these people from Bani Israel, they were influenced and they were just walking by. They were just passers-by. They weren't living with them, right? These people weren't, you know, helping them. They weren't doing any of that. They were just passing by and they witnessed these individuals uh, worshiping deities besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so therefore they became influenced. So I turned to Musa. They said, Ya Musa, ij'alana ilahan kama lahum aliha. Make for us uh, a deity the way that they have deities. Uh, <coughs> so that was number one. Number two, they, there was a da'i amongst them. There was a caller amongst them that uh, Allah Ta'ala knows best, but it seems like uh, he was plotting this from the beginning. So there was a man, and, and the Qur'an calls him a Samiri. The Qur'an calls him a Samiri. And Al-Qurtubi, rahimahullah, he mentions uh, that a Samiri was a man from a people who worshipped the cow. Right? So we know today, the people who worship the cow are who? The, the Hindus. Allah knows best if this is where uh, he was from, if he was, if he was Hindu or if he was from India. Allah Ta'ala knows best. A Qurtubi just mentions he was from a people. Those people who he's from, they worship the cow. They worship the cow. And then he came to Egypt and he entered into the religion of Bani Israel with Zahir. This is the statement of an Imam Al Qurtubi that Zahiran. The outward appearance is that he accepted the religion of Bani Israel. And so what's understood from that, and Allah Ta'ala knows best, is that Al-Qurtubi is saying that you know, he outwardly accepted the religion of Bani Israel, which is the religion of Tawheed. However, in inwardly, he still had the remnants of you know, the religion of, of his people. And so uh, he was the Ra's fil fitna. He was the one who actually made the call to the fitna. <coughs> because, uh, and as Imam al-Tabari, rahimahullah, he mentioned from the reports of Zayd ibn Aslam or uh, ibn Ishaq, 
don't remember if it was Zaid ibn Aslam or if it was Ibn Ishaq, it was one of the two. Uh, but the chain of narration is authentic, where they mentioned that uh, after Musa salam had left, uh, they, had, they had taken some of the jewelry of, the, of Fir'aun and his people. And so one report mentions that uh, it was Harun who told them that it was not permissible for them to enjoy this, uh, enjoy this, this jewelry. So make a fire and throw in the, the gold and throw in the jewelry until, and, let, and then we'll, we'll, we're going to melt it down. And when Musa comes back, Musa will decide on what's going to happen uh, with this. Another report mentioned that the, the idea came from a Samiri himself. It was his idea to build the fire and to put the gold and the jewelry into the fire. Al-Muhim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that when, uh, when, when, alaykum salam wa rahmatullah, Allah Ta'ala mentions that when Musa came back, he became angry. <coughs> and he first, he addressed uh, Bani Israel, and he addressed his brother uh, Harun. And then Harun, you know, he mentioned to him what took place. And so then Allah Ta'ala tells us that Musa, he addressed a Samiri. He addressed a Samiri. Allah Ta'ala says, Qala fama khatbukum, fama khatbuka ya Samiri. What's your affair? You know, what's your deal? You know, what's going on with you, O Samiri? This was the statement of Musa. Meaning, why would you provoke all of this? You know, what's your intention? What's, what's your situation? Explain to me, you know, explain yourself to me. And so, uh, a Samiri, uh, he said, قَالَ بَصُرْتُ بَصُرْتُ بِمَا لَمْ يَبْصُطُ فَقَضَطُ قَبْطَةً مِنْ أَثَرِ الرَّسُولِ فَنَبَذْتُهَا وَكَذَلِكَ he said, I've seen what other people have not seen. I've seen what other people, uh, they did not see. And so I took a, a qabda, which is a, uh, huh? a handful, right? He took a handful of ather of rasul. Now what he's saying is, because what happened with, with uh, the rasul, what he's referring to is, uh, he's saying that he saw the tracks of the horse that Jibreel was riding on. Jibreel was riding on the horse and he saw the tracks of the horse that Jibreel was riding on and so he took a handful of the, that track and he tossed it into, uh, into the fire. He said, uh, sawwalat li nafsi. And this in my soul, myself, enticed me to do this. Myself, it enticed me to do this. So the origin the origin of the worship of the calf and the creation of this calf uh, in order for it to be worshipped came from where? It came from the nafs or the desires of a Samiri. came from the, the desires of a Samiri. And, and Musa alayhi salam, he eventually ended up um, ordering an embargo, is that, if that's what you call it, I think, or a, a, a hajr against the Samiri. Uh, la misas, you know, no one shall deal with him. Meaning, there's no la misas. Meaning, uh, so you know, when you make a trade, what, when you when you make a deal, what what do you do with people when you make a deal? It's like if I want to buy your car, you say you're selling it for a thousand dollars. I say, okay, I'll give you a thousand dollars. You say deal. I say deal. What do we do? Shake we shake hands on it, right? We shake on it. And so Musa alayhi salam he said la misas. You know, there's going to be no touching. Meaning that, that there is going to be uh, a hajr, that we're going to all, a command from Musa alayhi salam is that no one is going to deal with him. No one's going to trade with him. No one's going to do anything with him. Uh, and there's no deals that will be made with him. And so this, this, was, uh, this was the punishment for uh, a Samiri from Musa uh, because of his role that he played in the creation of <coughs> in the creation of this calf, and you know, getting trying to convince people uh, to worship it. Now, when the when when the Samiri, when he did what he did with the fire and, and what he placed inside of there, and it came out as the 
uh, in the shape of, of like a, of a calf, um, the winds blew, the winds blew, and the winds went into this uh, structure or calf-like uh, looking like uh, idol, and it started to make a noise. It started to, to start to make a noise like a cow. And Allah Ta'ala called it khuwar. It was like a mooing of, of a cow. So if you ever had a hollow metal uh, drum, right, and, and wind was to go into that drum, it would start to make like a sound. Like if you're sitting in your car and the windows are cracked a little bit, and the wind starts blowing really hard, it's going to make a noise. It's going to make some type of noise. Uh, and so, likewise with this, with, this, uh, with this calf, it must have had some type of holes in, in it on the front, in the back, or maybe in the sides. Uh, in the side. So when the wind went into it, uh, it started to make a noise, like a hollow, like a hollow noise, and it started uh, to sound like the mooing of, uh, of a cow. And this was one of the ways that, uh, that the Samiri was able to convince Bani Israel that this was their ilah. This is the ilah of, of Musa and Harun. Uh, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this uh, and he blames Bani Israel uh, for, for this when he says, وَاتَّخَذَ قَوْمُ مُوسَى مِنْ بَعْدِهِ مِنْ حُلِيِّهِمْ عِجْلًا جَسَدًا لَهُ خُوَارٌ أَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّهُ لَا يُكَلِّمُهُمْ وَلَا يَهْدِيهِمْ سَبِيلًا اِتَّخَذُوهُ وَكَانُوا ظَالِمِينَ Allah Ta'ala says, And the people of Musa, they took for themselves after him from their jewelry, عِجْلًا جَسَدًا لَهُ خِوَارٌ أو لَهُ خُوَارٌ He said, they, an ijl, or the calf, that has a shape, has a body, لَهُ خُوَارٌ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blamed them for taking this statue as a deity worthy of worship besides Allah. But he said, Lahu khuwar, it had, a, had that sound. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he, he mentions here why they should have used their intellect and why this calf did not deserve to be worshipped. Allah says, Alam yaro annahu la yukallimuhum. Did they not see that this, this calf did not speak to them? Nor did it guide them any, 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 in any sabi. Did it not send them down or guide them in any way? And so these are two things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned as reasons why this calf does not deserve to be a deity worthy of worship. The first is that it doesn't speak. Alam yaro annahu la yukallimuhum. Did they not see, like, Allah is saying, they should have known that this, this calf shouldn't be worshipped. Why? Because it doesn't speak to them. It does not have the abilities to speak. And so therefore, any entity that does not have the ability to speak is not an entity that deserves to be worshipped. And so those people who come and they tell us or they try to explain to us and they say, well, Allah Ta'ala doesn't speak. لَيْسَ لَهُ صِفَةُ kalam. He doesn't have, he's not attributed uh, this, you know, the attribute of speech is not attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We say, well, Allah azza wa jal blamed Bani Israel when they took the ijl as a deity to be worshipped besides Allah. Allah said to them that they should have known that this, deity, that this calf was not deserving of any worship because it didn't speak. And so you're now trying to tell us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not speak after Allah ta'ala has already explained that an entity that doesn't speak is an entity that doesn't deserve to be worshipped. Alam yaro annahu la yukallimuhum wa la yahdihim sabila. Did they not see that he did, it did not speak to them nor did it guide them in their path? Allah says, اتخذوهو وكانوا ظالمين. They took it as a deity worthy of worship and they were oppressive. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us that once Musa alayhi salam, uh, once he returned and he found the people doing what they're doing and he approached, uh, he approached Bani Israel and they explained themselves and he approached Harun and he explained himself and there's all of this, the details of all of this is mentioned in the Quran. 
in different places in the Quran, the de you can find the details of exactly what was said, how it was said, what did Musa do, how, why did Harun respond the way he responded. These, uh, they were trying to kill him, they would, they would have killed him. That was one of the excuses that Harun had mentioned to his brother, when, when, because Musa was angry with his brother. He grabbed him by his head, the hair on his head, and by his lihya. He grabbed him like this. Grabbed him by his lihya and grabbed him by the hair on his head. And said, you know, what are you doing? You know, look how did I left you in charge and look what happens now. And so he said, you know, oh, son of my mother, please let me go. They, they were going to kill me. And then he said, I, I was afraid that you would have said that I divided up uh, Bani Israel. Al-Muhim, uh, all these details are mentioned in the Quran. So now, after Musa, alayhi salam, he gets the explanation he understands what happens. Uh, so now comes the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now comes the ruling of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, which Allah ta'ala mentions in his statement in, in, in Surah Baqarah, uh, which is this is, the, is this is the ayah in question where Allah ta'ala says, With qala Musa li qawmihi ya qawmi innakum zalamtum anfusakum bittikhadikum al-ijla fatubu ila bari'ikum فَاقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ عِنْدَ بَارِئِكُمْ فَتَابَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah Ta'ala says, And when Musa said to his people, O oh my people, indeed you have oppressed yourselves by taking the calf, meaning taking the calf as uh, a deity of worship. So repent to your Creator, فَتُوبُوا إِلَى بَارِئِكُمْ يعني تُوبُوا إِلَى, خليق, إلى خَلِقِكُمْ so he said, so, so make toba, repent to your barit, meaning repent to your creator. Repent to your creator. So kill yourselves, that is better for you uh, with your creator, uh, that he may repent or accept your repentance. Indeed, he is the one who accepts the repentance and the merciful. So the first question that we had uh, in reference to last week was in reference to the method in which when Allah says, فَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ so, so kill yourselves. How did that take place? Um, and so the, 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 the how of that was explained. You can find the narration from an Imam Az-Zuhri as well as uh, Qatada bin Du'ama as sadusi And I think we should, uh, these names should be very familiar, right? Who's Az-Zuhri? Who remembers? Ibn Shihab al Zuhri, he's from the, the, the Tabi'een. And Qatada ibn Du'ama al Sadusi is also from the Tabi'een, one of the students of uh, Anas ibn Malik from Al Basra. Uh, from al -Basra. And Al Imam al Zuhri was from Ahl uh, al Madina. So they both said, both al Zuhri as well as uh, Qatada, they both said that the way this was done, when when Musa alayhi salam, when he ordered for them to kill themselves, meaning, and, and this was a command from, from, his, from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, they stood in two lines. They stood in two lines and they started to kill one another until it was said to them, stop. So they stood in two lines and they started to kill one another until it was said to them, enough, kufu, uh, stop, you know, that's enough. Uh, Mujahid ibn Jabr, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, who is also he's from the Tabi'een, who is from the students of Ibn Abbas, from the people of Mecca. <coughs> uh, this report is also found in the tafsir of Imam al Tabari with the authentic chain. Uh, he said that uh, Musa commanded his people, uh, as a command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they should kill one another with daggers. They should kill one another uh, with daggers. So a person would kill, one person would kill his father, and a person would kill uh, his son until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repented or accepted the repentance of these individuals. And so what happens, so from this we see that uh, when Allah azza wa jal ordered Musa alayhi salam to tell his people to kill themselves, what that meant was for one of them to kill the other. One would kill another person. Like when Allah Ta'ala says, 
فَإِذَا دَخَلْتُمْ بُيُوتًا فَسَلِّمُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ And when you enter houses, then give salams to yourselves. Meaning, you should give salams to one another. Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ And do not... Uh, and do not make fun of yourselves, meaning do not make fun of one another. Do not call one another offensive uh, nicknames. And so he says, فَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Meaning one will kill the other. And they stood in two lines and with daggers, and the father would be in front of his son, the son would be in front of his father, and they would kill one another. And they killed one another. And then once that started taking place, and, so, and they start, and, and a, a group of them, uh, they died. It was said to them, kufu. It was said to them, enough. Stop. And once they stopped, once they stopped, uh, those, who were li- well, those who died, it was written for them as a shahada. And then those who lived, it was written for them that it was toba. And so those, there were those who died in that. There those from Bani Israel who died. In that incident, and they were uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala accepted uh, their repentance, and then then there are those who stood to die, those who prepared themselves to die, and took place in that event for them to die, but they lived, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala accepted uh, their repentance. And so the next issue was the issue of the statement of Allah Taala for Taba alaykum. I think it was Rashid that mentioned. Well, did, doesn't that mean that Allah, re, the, Allah accepted their repentance and so therefore they didn't, no, nobody had to die? Uh, and the answer to that is there is a, um, in that statement there's something that is mahdhuf. And what's mahdhuf or what's, what's not mentioned explicitly is فَمْ تَثَلْتُمْ فَتَابَ عَلَيْكُمْ So فَاقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ عِنْدَ بَارِئِكُمْ فَمْتَثَلْتُمْ فَتَابَ عَلَيْكُمْ So that's, so the meaning of the verse فَتَابَ عَلَيْكُمْ So he rep- accepted your repentance, meaning because they did what they were commanded. Because they implemented what Musa actually told them. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted uh, their repentance. Uh, because those, uh, who, those they, cause all of the people participated in the, uh, in the calf incident stood to get killed. Some of, them, some of them died, some of them lived. Some of them died, some of them lived. After a certain amount of people from amongst them died, Musa alayhi salam ordered that they, they were to stop, and that was sufficient. So the ones who died, they died, and Allah, and Allah azza wa jal uh, gave them shahada, and then those who lived, they lived, and Allah ta'ala gave them uh, repentance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Now, inshallah, we can call the adhan, and then inshallah, if there's any other questions, well, we can take... Uh, questions at that time, inshallah. So it was Qatada who said, كانت شهادة للمقتول وتوبة للحي. This was the statement of Qatada. Qatada bin Du'ama Sadusi, rahimahullah, he said, it's reported by Imam al-Tabari with an authentic chain. He said, كانت شهادة للمقتول وتوبة للحي. It was 
written as a shahada. Um, uh, it was martyred. The ones who were killed were martyred, and the ones who lived, uh, it was their repentance. So there was no war between the two groups, no? No, there was no war. No, I don't know. A, a war? No, nah, there's no. Uh, Allah knows better. Because what. what so, how Now, the, the, the way that it took place was, as I mentioned from the tafsir of. So, there's some narrations that are da'if uh, in reference to the story. Uh, Imam al Tabari, rahimahullah, he mentioned some of them, and some of the narrations, some of the stories connected to this are da'if. Uh, and I tried to, to pick out that, you know, that which was mentioned as sahih, as well as mujiz. It was, it was uh, summarized without, because there's some long stories connected to this. Naam. Madri. La adri. Naam. The story of the cow, the baqarah, naam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it after. Uh, he mentions it after he mentions this. Uh, he mentions this. He mentions this. Uh, then he mentions um, them entering into the city. He mentions them with uh, uh, Musa uh, The story of when they uh, had the the quails descending upon them from the sky, and they said, "You know, give us, uh, you know, we want onions and beans, right?" And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions with Qala Musa baqarah. So after Allah Ta'ala mentions the story of the Baqarah, after he mentions all of these stories. So uh, is that an indication of a timeline? Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala knows best. That was also mentioned before, uh, before, this, the, uh, before the story of the Baqarah. Again, uh, that doesn't necessitate, because there are suwar, there are suwar, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions things as a timeline. But then there are other suwar where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions things that we know are outside of the timeline. Right? And so um, it doesn't necessitate the fact that Allah ta'ala mentions one story after the other would be uh, a person would you know, this, what's the first thing that comes to mind is that this took place after this. However, um, it's not something that I have actually looked into to see, uh, you know, did the ulama say that, yes, this means the fact that Allah Ta'ala mentioned this story after this story means that this story took place after this story. Allah Ta'ala knows best. Now, then they wandered in the desert. Arba'ina sana. Yeah. Allah, Allah Ta'ala, no, Allah Ta'ala knows best. Inshallah Ta'ala, we have to, you know, the story of Musa, actually, uh, some of the stories of the prophets, actually, uh, I have a book where the stories of the prophets are in volumes. And the story of Musa takes two volumes by itself. Uh, and so, you know, the, 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 the details of, of, of what, and the reason why uh, Allah Ta'ala mentions, or commands the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to mention the story of Musa, because there's, there's so many similarities between Musa and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you notice in the Quran, the story of Musa is mentioned over and over and over and over again. Uh, Musa Alaihi Salam and his, his story from birth, his story with the Sahara, his story with Bani Israel, his story uh, with Fir'aun, uh, all of that is mentioned in, in, in explicit details. 
Whereas you have some stories of the prophets that are mentioned and there's only highlights. Right? Then, but with the story of Musa alayhi salam, there is so many details that if we really wanted to give the story justice, then we would have to sit and you know, make a series of lectures uh, for Musa uh, alayhi salam. Uh, you know, just with his mother, for example. We, we, should, we could do a lecture or two, uh, a lecture or two just on the story of Musa alayhi salam when he was born and his mother putting him in the tabut and putting him in, in, the, uh, in the river. Like that in and of itself is, is a dars that we, we, we would need to have um, you know, to highlight the fawaid or the benefits that are extracted uh, from that story. So uh, I know that uh, everybody has questions because the story of Musa alayhi salam is even something that uh, in, in, in the Christian uh, religion uh, they have their own stories. There were movies. There's movies that have been made uh, here in America. They made movies out of Musa. They actually, when I was a kid growing up, uh, we they used to show it. Uh, it was like a week long. Uh, it was like a TV series, and they it would play it for a whole week every year. Uh, you know, and as kids, we would come. Our parents would bring us to the t television and make us watch it and things like. That. They even made I think uh, in the last ten years, I think they made another movie about Musa alayhi salam according to you know their stories or whatever the Hollywood they did the whole Hollywood thing uh, Musa alayhi salam is very popular uh, especially here in America uh, a lot of people cling to the story of Musa uh, you find a lot of Christians you know clinging to uh, Musa and his uh, and his story may Allah ta'ala guide us all now Ah, yes. Jazakumullah um, khairah. And so, we, we, we saw, it was, it, was, it was something that we, we see sometimes here in our masjid, and that is where uh, <coughs> uh, you have individuals who, who, who stand up, they make salat, they may say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and then immediately they stand up for sunnahs. Right? By the time I turn around after the salat, there's people, they've already stood up in their place for making sunnahs to the point where it seems like they are continuing uh, in their salat. And so you don't know if they have broken, you know, they, if they broke a rakah and they're repeating a rakah. We don't know because it looks like they are connecting their sunnah prayers with the, the mandatory prayers. And this, is, and this is something that should be avoided. This is something that should be avoided. Number one, firstly, because the sunnah of the voluntary prayers is in the home. The Prophet wasallam he said, La taj'alu buyutakum qubura. Do not make your homes graves. Do not make your homes graves. And one of the explanations of that is, do not turn your, uh, your houses into places where there's no salah. Do not turn your houses into places where there is no salah. And the Prophet wasallam used to pray his sunan al-rawatib. He used to pray them in the house. He used to pray all of his sunan al-rawatib. He used to pray them in the house. So this is the sunnah of the, the ratiba of the salah. However, if a person is going to uh, the, if a person is going to pray his sunnahs in the masjid, for example, maybe he feels like if I go home, then I might get lazy and I'm not going to end up praying my salah. If I, if I on the way home, I might break my wudu and then uh, I just won't, you know, it may be hard for me while I come salah. It may be hard for me to, uh, you know, to make wudu and to make the salah in my house. So if I leave the masjid and I haven't prayed my sunnahs, then I probably won't pray them. It's permissible to pray the sunnahs in the masjid. So firstly, it's, 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 it's the sunnah of the rawatib is to pray them at home. That's number one. Number two, if we're going to pray them in the masjid, then a person should make a, uh, a decisive, he should make, he should make a decisive break between his salah, his, his, his mandatory salah, and his voluntary salah. As it came in the hadith in Bukhari, uh, in, 
or, or Muslim. It came in the hadith of Muslim uh, from the hadith of Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan uh, where he said that the Prophet wasallam commanded us that we should not connect one salat with another salat unless we speak or we leave. We speak or we leave. So he said the Prophet wasallam commanded us an la nasila salatan bi salat. He said we, the Prophet ﷺ commanded us that we should not connect one salat with another salat. And so what that means is when a person, uh, he should not, after his Isha or after his Maghrib, immediately stand up and uh, you know, make it like he's connecting those two rakah of Sunnah with the four rakah of Isha. But rather he should move, he can move, or he can speak. Right? He, can make, he can make a statement to someone or something that indicates that he has separated his mandatory salat from his voluntary salat. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. Naam. Hey, Naam. Hey, what? Oh, he left? And he came back? Uh, it's permissible to move the sajada. It's not haram to move the sajada. The only issue is, what do you do? You take it and you, you toss it to the back, as if you know, like so that would make that would make you know it may, it may make someone feel like you know my property was disrespected. And so, what what should happen in this case is if a person, if one of us needs to, if we break our wudu. Uh, and we need to go, we need to leave the saf, and we take, our, we, take this, we take the sujada with us. Uh, I think it, and in those cases, I think it, would, it may create confusion. Uh, and so what, ha what should happen is if the person doesn't know that he's supposed to move, let everybody stay as is for, at, at this point, and then let uh, afterwards someone should raise the, because I didn't even know that this took place. This, this happened right behind me. I didn't even know that it, ha that it happened. I didn't, even, I didn't even hear anybody leave. So what should happen is someone, you know, inform uh, the people of knowledge, if you're in, let's say you're in a different masjid, for example, and it happens. You inform the people of knowledge in that masjid, and then the people of knowledge of the masjid would find a time to educate uh, the community on what is supposed to happen. But because if you're in the salat and you you know you start pushing somebody, right, and the person doesn't know already that they're supposed to move, like they may think you're trying to fight them, you know, they may push you back, right? Now you know, and then he may get angry, and you know he lean, you know he he leans into it, right, and then you fall on the floor. And then you fall into someone else, and it could create a bunch of confusion, right? And so I believe in this case, if the people don't know what to do, then let the people stay as is, because they're ignorant, right? They don't know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Rabbana la tu in nasina aw akhtana. Oh our Lord, do not hold us accountable if we forget or if we make a mistake. And so a mistake based on ignorance is forgivable. And so, but once that takes place, we you know, it's, it's easier just to leave them as is and then make the correction in a way that people will accept it versus creating confusion and then you have a big problem on our hands. Which is why the Prophet Wasallam, when the A'rabi, when the, uh, when the Bedouin man came and he urinated in the masjid, right? Which, is that permissible for a person to come and urinate in the masjid? No, it's munkar. It's munkar. So the Sahaba, they, they, they jumped up, they wanted to harm him. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, leave him be. <coughs> Why? Because if they would have chased, he would have ran while he was in the middle of doing his business, Akramakumullah. And then the Najasa would have spread to all over the masjid. At least now, it's, it's, you know, it's containable. It's controllable, right? And so, so there are times when we, this is, we have to take this approach that we have to ask ourselves, you know, this is a munkar that's taking place in front of us but if we try to correct it in a way that's going to create a bigger munkar, it's going to create a bigger evil, 
then maybe we should just let it slide and then we correct it at a time when uh, it's going to, the correction is going to be accepted. Because if we start fighting and pushing each other in the salat, people falling into one another, uh, you know, people might get angry, just walk out the masjid. Right, people may get angry, walk out the masjid, and say, "Ah, these guys, these brothers, they, you know, they, I'm trying to make salat, and they're they're fighting with one another." And so, and, you know, it should have been left. I guess that's what what happened, right? That's what happened. Is so what should happen is, I believe, what what should happen. Number one, the, the ideal thing to happen is that the person should take his sajada with him. If he does not do that, then the brother next to, to, to the next to the sajada can kindly pick up the sajada, maybe fold it, and slide it to the back or slide it to the side. And then when the person comes back, uh, I guess they can figure out. Yes, they should, they should slide down in order... Yeah, see, this sujada issue is, uh, I, <laughs> because see, because during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Salaf, they didn't bring, uh, each person didn't have an individual sujada. So this is something that, you know, is something that is new to us. Uh, yeah, we, let me, I need to think about it and see, uh, because you're right, is it might cause a lot of confusion, you know, everybody moving, bending down, picking up their sujada. You know, you know, you bump into, excuse me, brother, I'm sorry, you know, it, you know, in the middle of the salat, you know, uh, and so we need to kind of, uh, we need to discuss this, you know, take some time uh, and think about this and, and, and see, I'll ask some, I'll ask some of my, some of my, some of the other imams, have they encountered this and if they have come up with a solution for it, uh, inshallah, if, and I'll, I'll, I'll report back with what I find, inshallah. Yeah, but see, the problem is we have brothers in our masjid who believe that any movement is a, it will nullify the salat. There's certain madhahib, and some of our brothers who have that madhahib, they pray with us. They, that's why you find when somebody's phone is ringing, right, and it's disturbing, they don't reach in their pocket and, and turn it off because they believe that if they move with a movement that's not from the salat, that it nullifies their salat altogether. And so this is another issue that we have to take into consideration. Yeah, but then what happens if that person's there in the middle, and then now we have to go around them? And it's, 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 you know, it's something that let's, let's, because uh, we're past the time for the salat, so let's, let's, some, let's, let's sit back and let's contemplate about the issue, and hopefully, inshallah, we'll find a solution. Hada wa ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Muhammad.